Now Königswinter's best and worst points. On the plus side, we think it's a lively town and also a good base for walking. On the minus side, we found it a bit too touristy. Working south, the next resort is Andernach. Andernach is an attractive small town which was founded over 2,000 years ago by the Romans. It has a fine historical legacy which includes the 12th century castle that forms part of the medieval wall encircling the old town. Much of this wall is still intact. You can walk all the way round it. The town itself is charming, quietish and well preserved, yet not too touristy. The high street, Hochstrasse, is lined with pavement cafes and wine taverns and links up with narrow streets where there's a surprisingly good range of shops for such a small town. The baker's boy's statue in the market square is the symbol of the town and the square itself and its restaurants and bars are the focal point for activity in the evening. The hotels in Andernach are mainly small and family run. Most overlook well-tended gardens and an attractive tree-lined promenade which runs directly alongside the river. We think the best thing about Andernach is its history. On the minus side, some people might find it too quiet, particularly in the evening. Our next resort is the main tourist centre for the whole area, Koblenz. Koblenz is a small, compact city built where the River Mosel joins the Rhine. It's dominated by the Ehrenbreitstein Fortress, 300 feet above the river. From here you get a fine view of the city. Koblenz has a picturesque old town and several impressive buildings like St. Castor's Church. Much of the city was destroyed by the Allies in the Second World War, but it's been largely rebuilt in the traditional style, and it's very attractive. The easiest way to explore the city is on foot, and one of the best walks is to go along the Rheinanlagen, the Rhine Promenade. This riverside walk through a series of gardens stretches for about five miles up to Deutsches Eck, German corner, where the two rivers join. The monument here is a popular attraction. The path then follows the Mosel towards the Old Town. The city centre has a lively cosmopolitan feel with a good choice of restaurants, inns and cafes. The character of Koblenz, though, is centred in and around the Old Town squares. Here it's relaxed and friendly. Koblenz is excellent for shopping and not as expensive as many German cities. Lorestrasse, the bustling main shopping street, has a wide choice of shops and department stores, catering for all tastes. Nearby is the Lora Center, a large indoor shopping precinct on three floors, again with a good range of shops. Koblenz has a large outdoor complex of swimming pools alongside the Rhine. It's well equipped and some of the pools are heated. It's open every day during the summer and costs about five pounds. One of the liveliest meeting places for tourists and locals is the Weindorf, or wine village. It's just outside the city centre and is a popular place to sample some of the locally produced Rhine and Mosel wines. Every evening there's dancing to a local band. We think that Koblenz is a good base for touring the rest of the area and is also very good for shopping. On the minus side, many things tend to be more expensive than the smaller resorts. Hotels particularly cost more. The next resort to the south is Bopart. Bopard lies about 14 miles south of Koblenz on the west bank of a huge curve in the Rhine. It's a very popular resort with British holidaymakers. The town was founded by the Romans and parts of the old Roman walls are still standing. It's a small quaint town with an attractive market square which is dominated by the St Severus church. The square is also the starting point for a sightseeing trip on a local tourist train. It costs about £1.30 and takes half an hour to go right round the town. Bopard has a very pleasant and colourful riverfront and just behind there are numerous cafes and restaurants. Also, many of the hotels are along this road. The main shopping street is parallel to the riverfront. Parts are traffic free and there are plans to pedestrianise the rest by next summer. There's not a huge selection of shops here, but they do know how to liven up the shopping. One of the best ways to appreciate the beauty of this area is to take the chairlift into the hills above the town. From one point here, the Rhine actually looks like a series of lakes. Now our verdict on Bopart. We think it's a lively resort and has no obvious disadvantages. However, out of the main season, it is a popular spot for British school trips, although we are told they're very well behaved. 
Eight miles south is Zankt Goa. Zankt Goa on the west bank is at the narrowest stretch of the Rhine Gorge. It's a small but busy town with a lively and friendly atmosphere. In the middle of the town, there's a pleasant little square where concerts are held regularly during the summer. And whether you're a local or just a tourist passing through, everybody is welcome to join in. One of St Goa's main attractions is Rheinfels Castle, which stands high above the town. As well as walking around the 13th century ruins, there's a museum and lots of tunnels to explore. It all costs about a pound and is well worth a visit. Next to the ruins is a hotel and restaurant <laughs> with a magnificent view over the town. St Goa's sister town is St Goa's Hausen, which lies directly opposite on the east bank of the river. There's no bridge. The two towns are linked by car ferry. The crossing takes about five minutes and costs 35 pence for pedestrians. St Goa's Hausen is possibly the more attractive of the two towns and has pleasant and well looked after riverfront gardens. It also has a very picturesque and charming medieval old town. But the Lorelei Rock is the main tourist attraction. It overlooks the narrowest part of the river gorge and is world famous for the legend of the Lorelei, the beautiful singing mermaid who sat on the rock and lured sailors on the river to their deaths. We think the best thing about the Zank Goa area is the Lorelei Rock and the spectacular views around the Rhine Gorge. On the minus side, there's not much else there. Further upstream is Rudesheim. Rudesheim is one of Germany's oldest resorts. It lies south of the Rhine Gorge where the river widens and the valley flattens out. Above the town is a fine viewing area where you can see for miles around. Rudesheim is a lively and popular town, very much geared to the holiday maker. There are many souvenir shops and it has its full quota of restaurants and bars. The town's railway line runs between the main street and the river front. Some of the hotels along this road can be noisy, though they do have good views of the river. Rudersheim is one of the Rhineland's best-known wine towns, and the hills behind it are covered with acre after acre of vineyards. Tourists are welcome, and there are over 50 miles of marked walks right through the vines. Some of these paths lead up to the Niederwald Park, or you can take a chairlift to the top. It takes about 10 minutes and costs £2.30, and it's a peaceful way to admire the scenery. At the summit is one of Rudersheim's principal tourist attractions, the Germania Monument. But Rudersheim's main attraction by far is the Drosselgasse, a narrow street in the heart of the town. It's known worldwide and has the liveliest collection of inns and wine cellars in the region. It's always busy, particularly in the evenings. People of all ages and nationalities join in the traditional nightlife. Most inns close at one, but some stay open until four. Even so, drunks are rarely seen or heard. We think that in Rudersheim there's lots to do. It's a lively resort with plenty of traditional German nightlife. The worst thing is the railway running along the riverfront. It's noisy and because of the level crossing, creates bad traffic jams. Well, that's our view of the resorts. Incidentally, the total distance from Königswinter to Rudersheim is 50 miles. Now, where to stay? Most visitors tend to stay in hotels or gas tops. Usually built in a traditional style, they're often small and family run. The standard, though, is invariably good and they're always clean and neat. You'll also see a number of castle hotels. What they lack in comfort, they make up for in atmosphere. Less expensive are the Zimmer Fries, meaning room free. They're usually in private houses or farms and offer basic B&B. &B. Most of the resorts along the Rhine have a camping and caravan site. They're normally open from May to September and tend to fill up quite quickly during high season. So unless you've booked, it's best to arrive before mid-afternoon. The sites are usually well organised, tidy, clean and well equipped. Many have very good facilities for children. Human Herberger or youth hostels are another cheap alternative and again some are in castles. This one at the fortress in Koblenz is a typical example and costs about £5 a night. Families can also stay in German youth hostels. All you need is a youth hostel passport which costs about £8. Again, everything is spotlessly clean. Or how about spending a night in a wine barrel? 
These original wine casks in Rudersheim have two beds, complete with ensuite facilities at the back. The local tourist boards are very good at finding accommodation. There are book rooms in both hotels and pensions, but to be sure of somewhere to stay, try to get there before four in the afternoon. Now, what sort of weather do they get in the Rhine Valley? With me, as usual, is John Ketley. John, how long is the season? Well, generally speaking, from May to September, but it is rather variable, the climate over there. It's just like the British Isles. Though, on the whole, it tends to be colder in the winter and rather warmer during the summer. The annual sunshine, nothing like what you get in the Mediterranean, of course, it's about the same as Skegness over in Lincolnshire. Looking at the sunshine through the year, then, only about one or one and a half hours of sunshine per day, on average, through the middle of winter there. And in the middle of summer, about seven hours, so that's not too bad. It can be very warm, of course, but not so much in the winter time. A bit cold for wearing leather shorts in the middle of winter. The average daytime temperature at that time of the year is about four or five degrees, that's all. And 24 degrees Celsius, 75 degrees Fahrenheit in the shade once we get through to the height of summer. It can be jolly cold at night as well, of course, from December, say, through to February. Temperatures then at night hovering around freezing for much of the time. And even in the middle of summer, well, nighttime temperatures rarely higher than about 15 degrees. Rain days, too, can be a bit of a problem. There's an awful lot of rain about in the Rhine Valley at certain times of the year, though it does tend to be wetter once you get further south into Munich. The rain days looking like this, then, you can see an abundance of them, and 16 or 17 days, on average, is quite likely in some of those months. Do you get flooding? Well, you certainly can do just to the south of Koblenz, where the River Rhine is very narrow indeed. It's like a gorge. And you do find in particular times of the year, like winter and spring after the heavy rains, that the water level does rise considerably. And you find actually in some of these villages in Germany that there are markers indicating the highest flood level. Are there any weather oddities? Well, only by virtue of the fact that we're talking about a river valley, so any river valley is prone to fog, can be very slow to clear, of course. John, why is it so good for wine? Well, that's what I wondered as well. It is, in fact, very far north. It's 48 to 50 degrees north, the most northerly point around the world for growing wine. Apparently, the soil's perfect. And they get about 100 days of sunshine once it starts flowering, once the vines start flowering. And that's just what you need for good white wine in particular. What time does it go dark, John? Very much the same as the British Isles, though they do turn the clocks back one month earlier at uh, the autumn period. John, if you could choose, which month would you go there? Oh, that's so difficult to answer, really, Penny, saying one month, because it is such a variable uh, climate over there. I think the only answer, really, is to watch the weather forecasts on television every day. And uh, if you can go away at the drop of a hat, then just do so when the weather looks like becoming more and more settled. Thanks, John. Now, some general information. You'll find the Rhine Valley people friendly and welcoming to tourists. The local German dialect can be a little difficult to understand, but English is widely spoken. The currency in Germany is the Deutschmark. This is divided into a hundred pfennigs. Many people consider Germany to be unaffordable, but the actual cost of holidaying there is not particularly high. As I mentioned earlier, accommodation costs about the same as in Britain. Food in the shops is also about the same, but eating out is usually cheaper. However, beware, you may have to pay for a view. Our production team were once charged two pounds for a cup of coffee in one picturesque location. Healthcare in Germany is first class, but costly. However, you are entitled to free medical treatment if you take your E111 form. We think it's definitely worth taking, by the way. In case of emergency, dialing 110 will get you through to the police, who will get you an ambulance. Now, how easy is it to get around? Germany has the world's best system of toll-free motorways called autobahns. At the moment, there's no maximum speed limit. However, on all other roads, speed limits are similar to Britain's and strictly enforced. Filling stations are usually self-service and petrol costs about £2 a gallon. Lead-free or Bly-Fry is available at 99% of all garages. If there's a pump attendant, you'll normally find that he'll clean your windscreen while you're filling up. It's customary to give a small tip. Germany has a system of theme roads which are marked for tourists. In this area, not surprisingly, the theme is wine. There are several wine roads or Weinstrasse which take you past some of the well-known vineyards. There are very few bridges along this stretch of the Rhine. If you want to cross, you'll need to use the car ferries. They operate throughout the day from virtually every town and village. On average, it costs about £1.50 to take a car across. Cyclists are well catered for in Germany. There are cycle paths alongside many of the roads. It's compulsory to use them. Quite often, you might have to ride against the traffic if the path is only on one side of the road. 
required to cycle tracks are well signposted and there are many pleasant routes running alongside the Rhine, particularly in the tourist towns and around Koblenz. It's also possible to hire bikes in the larger resorts. German Federal Railways, the Deutsche Bundesbahn, offer several kinds of good value tickets for travel within Germany. The main one is the DB Rail Pass, which is only available to foreign tourists. This pass allows you unlimited travel on the entire railway network. It's valid for four, nine or 16 days. A nine-day second-class pass costs £120. If you're under 26, it's £70. These passes also give free travel on railway buses. These often connect with the trains. Though they don't run between large towns, the buses do offer a very good service into the villages and hamlets of rural Germany. Public transport in this part of Germany isn't particularly cheap. Incidentally, if you're driving, you'll find that traffic moves fast, particularly on motorways. Also, the Germans tend to be very aggressive drivers. Now, what's it like to eat out in the Rhine Valley? Well, it can be quite cheap. You'll find Schnell Imbiss kiosks in most tourist towns. These fast food outlets are cheap with a good selection of German sausages and schnitzel. But regional food is well worth trying. A set meal will cost about seven pounds. Schmaltz is often served as an appetizer and it's basically dripping with little pieces of spicy pork. Soups feature heavily on menus, and vintner's soup is typical of this wine-growing region. It's the traditional soup for workers in the vineyards. It's full of potatoes, vegetables and pieces of sausage, and is very filling. In the same vein, but for a main course, there's vintner's steak, a spicy pork steak marinated in wine for a couple of days and then grilled. And, as with many German dishes, it's usually served with potatoes and a side salad. Apart from salads and some good local cheeses, choice is usually rather limited for the vegetarian. Most German meals are very much meat-based. However, there's usually a good range of fish available on the menu, salmon and trout being the most popular. As far as desserts go, the Germans are very fond of their ice creams and cakes, and there's always a wide variety to choose from. Menus are often in German only, so you may struggle a bit without a phrase book. However, in the main tourist towns, it's less of a problem. And look out for the hanging bush. Anyone can hang one outside their house, and it means they're offering locally produced wine, soft drinks and small snacks. Beer is, of course, the German drink. There are countless types to choose from, and a half litre costs about 50 pence. However, wine is a more popular drink in the Rhineland area, and there's an excellent choice of locally produced wines at very reasonable prices. They're mainly white, and the wines of the Rhine and Mosel are easily identified. The Rhine wines are in brown bottles, and the Mosel wines are in green bottles. Many people visit vineyards on their holidays and buy samples of local wine. You can bring home up to nine bottles of table wine per adult duty-free, but be sure to keep the receipt and don't buy any spirits in addition. You will see vine plants for sale and may be tempted to bring one home to start your own vineyard. Don't. Our customs don't allow it. Now, what else is there to do in the area? One of the best and most enjoyable ways to see the Rhine is by boat, and the Kern Düsseldorfer, or KD, is the largest passenger line on the river. The distinctive white ships operate between Cologne and Mainz. There are daily scheduled services from April to the end of October, and you'll see landing jetties in most towns and villages. The River Mosel is also popular for sightseeing boat trips. There are regular excursions from Koblenz to the many wine-growing villages dotted along this quieter river. A little further up the Mosel lies the city of Trier. Trier was founded by the Romans over 2,000 years ago and is Germany's oldest city. It has a picturesque old market square, but the main tourist attractions are the Roman ruins, the most important of which is the Porta Nigra. But the ruins of the Roman baths nearby are also worth a visit. And if you'd like to take home an original souvenir, genuine Roman relics can be bought at the local tourist office. One of the area's most popular for excursions is to the Maria Lach Abbey. It's built on the forested shores of Lachazee, a lake formed from a volcanic crater. It's about 20 miles northwest of Koblenz. Part of this lake is a nature reserve. At the northern end, off the beaten track, there's a very pleasant and tranquil bathing area, with a small campsite just behind it. 
The Abbey itself was founded in 1093, and since the last century it's been owned and run by Benedictine monks. This monastic community is now entirely dependent on tourists for money for its upkeep. Many of the monks also act as tourist guides. They also run an excellent restaurant and hotel. Next to the abbey, there's a garden well stocked with flowers and herbs, many of which are for sale. The abbey grounds are open every day during the summer, but the weekends tend to be rather busy. Now, what's Germany like for the independent traveller? We sent Matthew Collins to find out. Matthew, where did you stay? Well, I stayed in some of the Zimmer Fryer that you mentioned, and also the hotels. Not so expensive, and I was quite pleasantly surprised. But the best places I stayed in were a couple of youth hostels that were in castles. And I stayed in the one that you mentioned in Koblenz, the old fortress. But also this wonderful old medieval castle that had been restored in the 19th century in Bacharach, on the opposite side of the river, to Rudersheim. And that was absolutely wonderful. But, of course, the trouble is it gets so popular in the summer that you have to. it's worth booking up in advance if you want to stay there but people who aren't members of the youth hostel association can stay there providing they buy a guest membership card which is only about one pound sixty sounds good was it easy to get around it was quite easy to get around i mean great train system and bus system buses sort of serve to feed the trains or meet the trains and take you off into more rural country areas but to my absolute astonishment occasionally the trains would be late and once you got inside in the out into the countryside they were quite slow but there's a, a special offer that deutsch railways german railways have on offer and that's the regional rail pass and if you go on your holiday by rail from the uk you can buy this regional rail pass for 20 pounds for a single person that gives you unlimited rail travel over a period of 10 days throughout a period of three weeks in the Rhine Valley area, for example, or different areas within Germany. So that's worth, that's worth having. Fantastic. Did you do any walks? Yeah, I did. I actually got out into the Eiffel Mountains and past these wonderful old volcanic lakes near Down. And they, they were really nice. But the trouble was that I did that walking on my own because I wasn't there on a Sunday morning in Down. And on Sunday morning in Down, they have a, a walking club meeting. And this is open to tourists as well. The great thing about it is the Germans are so friendly. At 10 o'clock in the morning on Sundays in Down, and this probably applies to other places as well, everybody meets up at the post office and they go off into the mountains and do a different walk in different areas. And they invite tourists to do this and they're probably very glad to see them. Where else did you get to? Well, I got to the Nürburgring, Ring, which is a famous racetrack in uh, Germany. This was first opened in 1927, I think. It's a 21-kilometre racetrack, which is no longer used because there's a new one right near it. And they, they still use it. They don't use it for races, but they now open it to the public. And only for £4, you can just pay this little chap. He just looks like a sort of Benny Hill character. You can pay this chap and you can hack your car around this 21 kilometre racetrack as fast as you like, or your motorbike. And you see people coming from France, even Britain, to do it, and Belgium. It's so popular, of course. You know, you can just go like the clappers. But, of course, some people do, unfortunately, have accidents. I saw this poor guy had smashed up his brand new BMW on the day, and the authorities were actually very reluctant to admit how many casualties they had. They said sometimes they get a 1,000 cars on a good summer's day. But normally, they don't get more than two accidents, they say. Jeez. Did you sample much of the local wine? Yeah, I did. I went. To, I caught a wine festival, a wine fest in Boppard, which was quite interesting because there, well, to my surprise, they, they actually charge people more for the wine during the wine festival than they do normally. I mean, almost twice as much. And that, that was interesting because it, was just, it just seemed another excuse for the Germans to stuff themselves stupid with even more versatile sausage than usual and get as <laughs> drunk as anything. And all this took place in front of the church that you mentioned in, in Boppard. <sighs> Any tips? Yeah, do pack a good pair of walking shoes because there are wonderful walks to be had in the Rhine Valley. And also beware of the beer because it is very strong, twice as strong as the really wishy-washy stuff we get over here. But thirdly, if people are interested in staying for a rather longer time in the Rhine Valley area and, say, getting work in the vineyards, there is some occasional work to be had. But this is very badly paid by German standards. Only seven and a half marks an hour. That's about £2.50. But most of the people who do it are Poles who come all the way from Poland to do it. So you will be in competition with them. But if you hassle the vineyard owners enough, you probably will get work. Matthew, thanks very much. Well, that's our view of the German Rhine Valley. We're not producing a fact sheet, but we are happy to let you have a copy of the complete script, and this will include some extra information which we didn't have time for, such as our tips on what's worth buying, our notes on walking in the area, and some background facts on German beer. If you'd like a copy, it's £1.80, including postage. Send a cross-check or postal order for £1.80 and payable to the BBC. It's along Russia's road west in tonight's...